In 1984, the interest rate on a 30-year mortgage was around 15%, and bank savings accounts also yielded over 15%. You could guarantee that you would be paid 15% interest per year every single year for the next 10 years. That was the 10-year yield. Now, that may sound like something from another planet because over the last 40 years, we've seen all types of interest rates move significantly lower. But just over the last year and a half, we've seen interest rates move substantially higher. The 10-year yield now sits at 4.5%, breaking out from the downtrend in interest rates we've seen since the 1980s. In fact, the move higher we've seen on interest rates resembles what occurred towards the beginning of the large move higher in interest rates that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, a period that also saw huge economic volatility because of these rising interest rates, seeing four severe economic downturns occurring as a result. Now we could extrapolate that similarity to today and argue that we're heading for a similar extended period of rising interest rates, and it actually seems to be happening more quickly today. Back then, it took five years for interest rates to move up from 2% in the 1950s all the way up to 5%. Today, that has happened in less than three years. 10-year interest rates have increased to 4.5%. Now, if we decompose what has actually driven this large rise in interest rates, the biggest contributor is without a doubt what's called the federal funds rate. It has driven 2% of the 3.5% move in the 10-year interest rate that we've seen over the last two years. Now, of course, there's other risks like the market's expectation of future inflation and also something called the term premium. But if we look at what actually moves interest rates, it is the federal funds rate. And you can see that very clearly by looking at a chart of the federal funds rate with long-term interest rates on top, this is the rate that the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve controls, and that influences all the other rates in the economy. When it goes up or down, so do rates like mortgages and savings account rates. So it kind of puts a floor on all other interest rates that you see in the economy. And since the beginning of 2022, that is what we've seen drive all interest rates in the economy materially higher. In fact, the move in interest rates that we've seen in 2023 has just been long-term interest rates catching up to where the central bank has set the federal funds rate. So if we want to know if interest rates are going to continue rising, we need to look at the federal funds rate and where it is going next. If the Federal Reserve decides to continue raising the federal funds rate from here like they did persistently in the 1960s and 1970s, you're going to see all yields in the economy continue spiking. And one of the things that could actually cause that to happen would be another surge in inflation in the United States. That was the primary reason why interest rates rose in the 1970s and 80s because the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates to combat inflation. And we also saw this happen in 2022 where the Fed had to raise interest rates to combat the hot inflation that we saw. Now inflation has been falling steadily since June of 2022 and the federal funds rate now sits higher than the level of inflation. Generally, that's the formula that most economists agree is needed to reduce inflation. But if we see inflation begin to move higher again, that would lead the Fed to raise the federal funds rate again. Now, fortunately, that doesn't seem likely to happen very soon. If we look at the cost of housing, one of the largest drivers of inflation, it is showing signs of having slowed down significantly. The price of new rentals on Zillow are now back to the same level they were at before the pandemic, and so far not really showing signs of turning back up. This Zillow index actually leads moves in in the official shelter inflation data. And it does that by a few months. That's because it captures new rentals while the shelter CPI takes into account all types of rentals, including ones that were signed multiple years ago. So this is actually a useful leading indicator of housing and really does tell us where the official housing inflation number is heading over the next few months. And so inflation as a whole, because 44% of the actual inflation number is made up of shelter or housing costs. Food makes up 14% of what drives inflation. And if we look at that, it does seem to show signs of turning back up right now. That red line you see is agricultural and livestock prices. And they're moving a little bit higher again for the first time since 2021. That ultimately is a leading indicator of the prices that you're going to see at the supermarket. If the price of wheat on a farm rises, you're going to see that translate into higher prices for bread, pasta, cereals, 
And that usually happens with a seven month lag. If we add the official food CPI number, you can see it follows agricultural and livestock spot prices, but delayed by seven months. So this rise in spot prices that we're seeing on farms is suggesting that we're gonna see a little bit of an increase in food prices at the supermarket over the next seven months, but nowhere to the extent of what we saw in 2022, where food inflation reached a staggering 10%. So two of the largest components of inflation are for now not suggesting that we are going to see inflation rise in the near term and force the Federal Reserve to continue raising interest rates. Something else to consider is the potential for a recession. And these often occur after the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates aggressively as they've done so since 2022. In fact, pretty much all recessions happen after the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates aggressively as they've done over the past year. And you can see what happens during a recession the Federal Reserve usually tends to lower interest rates as inflation typically falls during those periods. And the central bank is trying to stimulate the economy by lowering interest rates to end the economic downturn. Now, one data point that is currently pointing towards an economic downturn is actually truck transportation employment. Every time that truck transportation employment weakens considerably, you tend to see the rest of the economy follow shortly after and a recession occurs. The reason that actually actually works is because trucking is very sensitive to the rest of the economy because it's directly involved in the transportation of goods. So if more truckers are needed, it means that more goods are being transferred and so the economy is picking up. If truckers are getting laid off, that's an ominous sign for the global economy. But even a recession doesn't 100% guarantee that interest rates are going to fall. In 1974, for example, we actually saw interest rates rise substantially during and even briefly after a very very deep economic downturn. If the same thing happens, it could mean that we're heading into a recession, but we continue to see interest rates rise during that period. Now, in order for that to happen, you would need to see what happened in 1973. Oil prices tripled overnight because of a geopolitical conflict in the Middle East. And so not only did it drag the economy into recession, but it also created a lot of inflation, pushing interest rates higher. If an oil shock occurred today because of the situation in the Middle East, we would all also likely see interest rates continue rising despite a severe recession playing out. But some people argue that even a recession over the next year is not 100% guaranteed. After all, in 2022, we actually saw GDP contract for two consecutive quarters in a row. That's the technical definition of a recession. And you can see GDP growth has been expanding since then. So maybe 2022 is all the recession that we're gonna get. If we are actually heading into another period of economic growth here, we would very likely see inflation begin to rise once again and drag interest rates higher along with it. And the reason we're quite confident in saying that is because we would see something called a wage price spiral. That's something we were beginning to see in 2022 because the number of job openings was incredibly high relative to the number of people unemployed. So there was a huge number of jobs with a small number of people actually looking for a job, which gave employees a huge amount of bargaining power to ask for a higher wage. When wages rise, it causes the prices of goods to rise, the cost of living to rise, which leads to people asking for even higher wages. And so that caused wage growth to skyrocket, driving inflation and interest rates higher. If we're entering another period of expansion here, well, you run the risk of seeing that happen again, which would force inflation higher and would push interest rates higher. Now, that's not what we expect at Game of Trades. We believe we are heading into a recession, that the Fed actually needs to create create a recession to make sure that inflation doesn't surge again. That would be healthy for the economy. If we see inflation picking back up from here, that could mean we begin to see something called rising inflation expectations. In fact, the head of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, recently mentioned that keeping inflation expectations anchored is one of their priorities because that was actually a big part of what led to the long-term problem of rising inflation in the 1970s. When you see high levels of inflation for a sustained period of time, people start to expect and anticipate higher prices. If people expect higher prices, they're gonna rush into buying things now. That increases demand, which drives prices higher and creates more inflation.
inflation. If we don't see a recession and inflation staying down, we could start to see a de-anchoring of inflation expectations. And that could actually be an environment where we see assets like Bitcoin rise substantially. This is something we showed our clients back in August of 2023, and it's up 40% since then.